Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Friday Film Show. As always, I'm your host David O'Sullivan and this is my weekly movie talk show in which every week I come to you and look back over the past week of movie news and give you my thoughts and opinions on all the movie news stories, movie trailers and new releases that most interest me. With that being said, let's just jump straight into this. And first up, I've got films that I've watched this week. And if you have caught the end of last week's episode, you know that the film being released here in the UK that I got the chance to see was The Light Between Oceans. And I was looking forward to The Light Between Oceans. I've heard mixed things, but I was I liked the look of the trailer, as I said last week. And I actually really liked this film. Now, I didn't love it. I didn't think it was a great film. But there was still a lot to like about this film, even though I did have some problems with it. And I didn't think it was that great of a film, but I did like it overall. For me, the best thing about this film were the performances. Both Michael Fassbender and Alicia Vikander continue to just really impress me. They're two of my favourite actors working today, particularly Michael Fassbender. He's one of my, I think, personally, I think he's one of the best actors in the business currently working today. I just I just love him in every single thing he's in, no matter what it is. And Alicia Vikander, I think, is great as well. Obviously, they're now together in real life, so it was cool to see the film that they met on. And like I said, I did like the film. I think the performances were the best parts of the film. They really anchored that film, and it revolved all around those main two. So, you know, it was, you know, a good thing that the performances were the best part of it. For me, it suffered a bit in terms of the pacing. It was quite slow moving. I mean, there were times when it was moving quite slowly and then there was other times when it really kind of rushed over things and rushed into things quite quickly. Like, it took... They, they rushed into the relationship, I felt, that happened too quickly, but then it took quite a while to get to the whole baby reveal, which I thought that would have come a lot earlier. But, yeah, even though I did have some problems with it, I did like it overall. It was what I expected from a kind of big, epic, sweeping romance melodrama kind of film and i did actually like it even though i did have some problems and i didn't think it was a great film i did like it overall and now let's just go straight into movie news topics and first up i've got a few pieces of comic book movie news here and the first one being that john wick director david leach lich is a strong front runner to direct deadpool 2 and i actually really like this piece of news i didn't even think it didn't even occur to me that one of the co-directors of john wick could be a director for the for Deadpool 2. I think that's a great choice. And nothing's official yet. There's not been any official confirmation that he is definitely directing Deadpool 2, but apparently he is the front runner. He's above and beyond everyone else. And for me, this makes the most sense. I can't believe I didn't even think of this myself, because even when back when I reviewed Deadpool, I think I mentioned that it was kind of a little similar to John Wick in terms of the kind of the visual stylized action. And I think the co-director, obviously the other guy who directed John Wick with him, I think he's doing, well, I think they're both doing John Wick Chapter 2, but obviously they want to get him for Deadpool 2, and I think it's a perfect choice because, like I said, the stylized, the visceral action of John Wick, I think, will work really well for a Deadpool movie. And, yeah, there's nothing much else to say about that. I think I really hope he does get the gig because I think that'll be a perfect fit. And even though I'm disappointed Tim Miller wasn't able to direct Deadpool 2, I think a John Wick director is just, that just that great i mean you can't get much better than that in terms of you know directors that are brilliant at filming action as well so yeah the next piece of comic book movie news i have is that benedict Cumberbatch says that doctor strange will bring the avengers together and if we look at what exactly he said here i think he has to be team doctor strange his job title is defender of the fabric of reality i mean he fights other dimensional threats that are beyond the perception of that very potent squabble i like to think he's going to help them both rather than take sides and for me i really like these comments and it makes perfect since having seen the film i think i really hope this is what happens this might just be what benedict Cumberbatch's idea is um it might not be what actually happens in avengers infinity war but i really hope this is the role that doctor strange takes at least toward the beginning of the movie because i think it makes perfect sense like i said having seen the film he's very much a guy who he doesn't he doesn't he's not going to take sides like like he says he's he's his his job is basically protect the fabric of reality you know so this kind of squabble is going to be very kind of like petty to him like kind of like thor in the first avengers <sighs> you people are so petty and tiny uh so yeah <laughs> i like the idea of him being able to kind of um be kind of the middle ground between these two and get them to just you know 
put their differences aside and work together. Obviously, they're going to be uniting to take on the bigger threat of Thanos and the Infinity War. But I really like the idea of Doctor Strange being the one to kind of get them to just shake them out of this petty squabble and get them to work together again. Him to be able to bring both sides together. I really like these comments from Benedict Cumberbatch and Scott Derrickson said similar kind of things. So I really hope this is what does actually happen in the film. That would be really cool to see. And next up, we have James Gunn as apparently directed Stanley's next four cameos and for me this makes sense I love the Stanley cameos I mean some people might get distracted by them or think they're a little off-putting but you know I love the Stanley cameos he came up with so many of these ideas and created so many of these characters I wrote so many of the comics back in the day for me I just I just love the fact when he pops up in a Marvel movie it's just so cool because you're never really expecting it because you, you're watching the film and enjoying the film and then when he does happen to pop up it's just a really nice pleasant surprise and there's been so many great Stanley cameos the past few years. My favourite would probably be, I mean this isn't an MCU film but The Amazing Spider-Man that is just such a great cameo where he's just, he's in the library with the headphones on and the lizard and Spider-Man are just fighting in the background which is such a cool cameo but even The Avengers Age of Ultra one excelsior uh, <laughs> i just love the stanley cameos they're, they're just so great uh, I, I you know put stanley in everything uh he deserves to be in all these films and the fact that james gunner shot the next four stanley cameos great because you know he's not getting any younger to say the least uh, i think he's like 93 or 94 or something it's incredible because he looks pretty good for his age but like i said he's not getting uh, any younger anytime soon so it makes sense that they get a load of cameos in the can so even if god forbid you know stanley does happen to pass away we've still got cameos that he'll be able to appear in these upcoming marvel movies so i think it's great and obviously they're usually kind of little side bits that they can film separately and then just shoehorn in there i wouldn't be surprised if one of those was the doctor strange cameo it might not have been that might have already been in the can but it seems like that could have been a thing that they could have shot extra and then just put in there Again, I like the Doctor Strange cameo, so yeah, I'm a big fan of the Stanley cameos. The fact that they've got the next four shot and in the can, great. Okay, next up we have The Flash loses director Rick Famuyiwa over creative differences. Like the Deadpool 2 situation last week, it's a little frustrating, so it's a similar kind of thing, departing because of creative differences. I mean, the reasons are probably very different. Um, obviously Tim Miller was coming off the successful Deadpool and they just brought Rick Famuyiwa on like a few months ago and it's it's weird because I wouldn't normally get worried over something like this because it happens quite a lot I mean we saw it with Tim Miller we saw it with Edgar Wright of course it happens all the time studios and directors falling out because of creative differences and I'm glad that he's left early so it doesn't end up becoming a big mess and conflict between the vision of the studio and the vision of the director but that being said it's a little worrying because I think the Flash originally had Seth Graham Smith, I think, if I remember correctly, and then he departed because of creative differences, and then they got Rick Famuyiwa, that seemed very solid, they were going with his vision, or they kind of, they had a vision together, and they were going with that, and now he's departed because of creative differences, and that, we don't really know what, you know, it's a big kind of umbrella term, creative differences, we don't really know what exactly it means, because surely they would have had a shared vision locked down when they got him on board. So maybe i'm thinking i'm inclined to believe that maybe they were trying to get him to shoehorn stuff into his movie to tie it to the other movies and he wasn't really comfortable with that perhaps and he wanted to just make a contained flash movie and he didn't want to have ties and connections to other movies maybe he wasn't comfortable with that and he left again this is speculation this might not be the case you know maybe they were trying to get him to put cyborg in there and he wasn't cool with that i, I don't know but for me it is a little worrying what warner brothers and dc are wanting to make this flash movie to be because it's a little worrying that like two or maybe even three directors is it have departed the project like it almost seems like the directors really want to make this movie but then they, they can't get along with Warner Brothers and DC because they don't like what they the direction they're going with this movie so it's worrying me a little bit what they're wanting to do with this flash movie why no director can get on the same page as them it's a little worrying but Again, it might all turn out great. We'll have to wait and see the replacement director. You know, like I said, with the Tim Miller Deadpool situation, I'm more than happy with the John Wick co-director taking over. It's a little more concerning with The Flash because it's happened like two or three times, but we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. And next up, I've got a few pieces of sci-fi and fantasy movie news. The first being that Doug Lyman is to direct Sci-Fi Unearthed. I'll just look at the article here the filmmaker isn't attached yet to the project but it is described as a lara croft meets indiana jones set in deep space so you know 
That sounds pretty cool. Jules Addison and Amelia Radcliffe join forces in a tomb raiding race on a newly discovered planet to unravel the secrets of an ancient, long extinct civilization, only to uncover a revelation that could spell the end of the human race. So that sounds pretty cool. It sounds like it's going to be this big, epic, sci fi fantasy adventure kind of film set in space. Lara Croft meets Indiana Jones. What's not to like about that? It might not turn out amazing, but the fact that we've got a filmmaker like Doug Lyman attached to it gets me excited because I absolutely loved Edge of Tomorrow. That was one of my favourite films of 2014. And he's he's done other stuff. Jumper wasn't that well received, but I, I like Jumper for what it was. And The Born Identity is great, obviously. So, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to seeing what he'll do with that kind of film. And I'm glad that because of the success, well, not, he wasn't that successful, but because of the, the big positive response he got from Edge of Tomorrow, and now he's been given opportunities to do much bigger sci-fi fantasy blockbuster movies and this sounds pretty cool so yeah i'm on board why not and next up also another doug lyman story is that doug lyman says edge of tomorrow is going to be a sequel that's a prequel and i initially thought hang on what, what is he talking about here is it a sequel or is it a prequel because so, a sequel is a set afterwards a prequel is a sequel that's set before and then i thought hang on a minute you know time travel time loops that's going to bring that into it and if I look at the comments of what he said exactly, that is the only sequel that I'm considering doing. And it's because, first of all, the story is so amazing, much better than the original film. And I loved, loved the original film. And second of all, it's a sequel that's a prequel. I've had some radical ideas about how to make a sequel that would interest me. I had these intellectual ideas on how you could make a sequel that are as unlike anybody else makes a sequel. And this script and this idea fit perfectly into that. So it's going to revolutionise how people make sequels. Again, this is quite big statements he's making here, some quite big comments, but... I like these comments and I like the fact that he's considering doing Edge of Tomorrow, the, the sequel to Edge of Tomorrow, because he thinks he could do a much better job. Not that the first one wasn't any good because it was great, but I like the fact that he's got some really big, bold ideas for a sequel. And it sounds pretty cool. It's a little vague, but in terms of, you know, being a sequel and a prequel, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to involve kind of some kind of jumping around in time. Maybe it's going to be set. Some parts will be set after Edge of Tomorrow and some parts will be going back in time, maybe into Emily Blunt's past, perhaps. That would be pretty cool if they tied that into there and weaved into that into the story. Who knows what they're going to do, but, you know, I really hope Doug Lyman does come back to direct Edge of Tomorrow 2. I'm not sure if he is locked down to direct the sequel or not. I think he's strongly considering it, but I really hope he does do it because I love what he did with the uh, first Edge of Tomorrow and I'd love to see him back doing this sequel. So, really looking forward to that and these comments sound great. And next up is that Johnny Depp joins Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them sequel. And yeah, apparently Johnny Depp is going to be in the sequel to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And I think he's also going to have a cameo in the first Fantastic Beasts movie. And it's rumoured he's going to be playing Grindelwald. And anyone who's not a big Harry Potter fan, Grindelwald is this dark wizard who I believe stole the Elder Wand when he was younger. Because I think we get that flashback in Death of the was it part one or part two, where we see this young kid steal the Elder Wand. And I think that was Grindelwald as a young man. And then I think we're going to be seeing Johnny Depp as the older Grindelwald, the full-on dark wizard with the Elder Wand. That's going to be really cool to see. I think he will be playing him. I mean, there's rumours he could also be playing young Dumbledore, but I seriously heard that's not true because I can't see that at all and I don't think that would make any sense, Johnny Depp playing a young Dumbledore. But as a, as Grindelwald, that really intrigues me because when I initially heard about this, Johnny Depp going to be in Fantastic Beasts, I was like, oh my God, really? I, I can't see that. How is that going to work? But when I heard that he could potentially be playing a dark wizard and he could be playing like a evil, psychopathic, crazy dark villainous character I was like that could be pretty cool because I don't want to see him playing a good guy playing like a kind of a good wizard but playing a dark wizard as an evil psychopathic villain as Grindelwald that would be really cool to see and if it's just even if it's just a small cameo role in Fantastic Beasts to see him come in there and have some make a really big impact in a small but significant scene that would be really cool and i think you might even be able to glimpse him in the trailer again i'm kind of jumping to conclusions here but there's a shot where you can see this character with blonde hair i think from the back and i think that might be johnny Depp's grindelwald i could be completely wrong but there's speculation that he is going to be in fantastic beasts in that role and i really hope it is true because that would be really cool to see and the last piece of sci-fi fantasy movie news is that jj abrams says that kylo ren has never met Ray. This is a very interesting comment here that uh, JJ Abrams made. Not a big piece of movie news really, but 
um, quite a big revelation actually and apparently he said it in the Star Wars Force Awakens commentary and his comments exactly were one of the new relationships that we were focusing on was between Kylo Ren and Rey they've never met but he's heard of this girl I really like this comments because for me this is confirmation that they're not related and that she's not Luke's daughter again I could be completely wrong but for me one thing like this did confuse me on is that I was dead set on I kind of put a lot of thought and speculation to this over the past you know year or so and I thought in Force Awakens that force vision that Rey has I thought oh maybe she was a little girl in that Jedi training academy and Kylo Ren was there and maybe it was Kylo Ren that put her on that planet to keep her safe because you know for, for whatever reason maybe, maybe that's what happened but I'm starting to rethink that theory now I think that but maybe she is related to Luke, or maybe not. Maybe she's just this really powerful child prodigy that she, Luke was training in secret so that she wasn't part of this Jedi Training Academy. Maybe Kylo Ren had heard of her. He came back to this Jedi Training Academy to try and find her, and maybe that's why he was outraged and then killed everyone because he was annoyed that he couldn't find her. And then maybe Luke hid her on that planet to keep her safe, and that would explain why in Force Awakens Kylo Ren gets really angry when he hears that guy tell him you know they, they also had a girl and he was like what girl as if he's heard of this really powerful uh young girl and that would explain then that he he knows who this girl could be and that he knows that there's this girl out there who's got this potential for really big power inside of her and yeah i think so yeah these comments are really quite intriguing actually and really quite revealing so i'm thinking perhaps she is not related to any of the main characters but that she does have this power and Luke was keeping her safe keeping her away from Kylo Ren and then Kylo Ren got annoyed again this is all just speculation on my part but then it would also explain why he gets angry when he hears about the girl in Force Awakens as if he's heard of her but he's never actually met her and he's been trying to like track her down and find her and then that's when he gets outraged when he finds out she's a part of all this but who knows? Again, I'm just this is all just speculation on my part. Let me know what you think about these comments, who you think Ray is, what you think about all this. I'd love to know. And now going on to just other movie news in general. And first up we have that Sherlock Holmes 3 is moving forward with a writer's room. And if I can if I look at this article, apparently it's a little worrying that they're putting a writer's room together because if they had a clear idea and vision of what they wanted from this third movie, I'd be really excited. I'd be like, yes, third Sherlock Holmes, because I like the first two. I really like the first one, and I really like the second one as well. I love what Guy Ritchie did with those first two movies. And I think they are quite well loved from an audience perspective. And a lot of people have a go at the second one and say it's not as good. But I, I like the second one just as much, maybe even more than the first one. I, I love them both, to be honest with you. And I'd love to see a third one. I don't know if I want any more past the third one. I'd like to kind of have the trilogy, in a sense, completed. One, two, three. I don't know if I'd be crazy about them expanding it into some much bigger thing. But I do would be intrigued to see a third one. When the second one came out, you know, Game of Shadows, it came out back in 2011. Obviously, Robert Downey Jr. has been very busy with Iron Man and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Jude Law has been doing stuff as well. But... Yeah, what does concern me is that they've had a need to put a writer's room together. That's not always a bad thing, but if they had a strong, clear vision and idea of what they wanted to pursue with this third movie, they wouldn't really need to do that. So this kind of makes me think that they don't really have any kind of ideas. They want to do it, but they've got no clue what they want to do, really. So let's just get those people together and try and think of what we can do. So, uh, however, the writer's room is quite promising. If we look at this, um, the screenwriting team of Nicole Perlman, who co-wrote Guys of the Galaxy, Justin Malin from Baywatch, Gary Witter from Row One, and Geneva Warwick Robinson, sorry if I'm butchering that pronunciation, from Tomb Raider and Kieran Fitzgerald from Snowden. Obviously, some names here are more promising than others, but in fact, we've got Nicole Perlman from Guys of the Galaxy, Gary Witter from Rogue One, and also the writer of Snowden. Um, I haven't actually seen Snowden, but I like that we've got very kind of different writers from very kind of different films Guys of the Galaxy, Rogue One, Snowden, Tomb Raider. It's, I think these writers will be able to come up with a really good idea. Obviously, it seems like they're still kind of brainstorming and thinking of what to do for a third movie, but I do hope they go ahead with this third movie whenever it does get around to happening. Because remember, I've followed comments from Robert Downey Jr. a while back saying that they wanted to move ahead with a third movie. It's been quite a while since he made those comments, but like I said, they've both been very busy and Guy Ritchie's been doing other stuff as well. But I do hope they get around to doing a third one eventually, if that is before these bigger Avengers movies or after those movies, when Robert Downey Jr.'s got more time, who knows. But... 
I would like to see a third movie. Like I said, I'm a big fan of the first two. And I'll be intrigued to see where they go with a third movie. I just hope Guy Ritchie comes back to direct this third film. And uh, yeah, next up I've got Tom Hardy is set to play Al Capone in Fonzo, directed by Josh Trank. And this was really surprising because, you know, if anyone's aware of Josh Trank's previous feature, which was Fantastic Four, and I don't think I've ever voiced my opinions on Fantastic Four, but I didn't like it. Let's just say that. To, the le- to say the least, I really didn't like it. And I actually had hopes and expectations of Fantastic Four. I actually liked the first teaser trailer. That really got me intrigued and quite excited to see what they were going to do. But obviously there was a massive big palaver behind the scenes. Josh Trank conflicting with the studio. Josh Trank's kind of behaviour on set it seems. Him, the studio kind of interfering. The not all getting along. And it was a massive colossal mess. And that, what well, it seems like anyway, and that really transferred over into the finished product. Because that film was just a complete and utter mess it's like what the hell happened but i do think josh trank is a good filmmaker i think he was just a little bit out of his depth he just got thrown into this big blockbuster movie after just directing one film although that first film chronicle i absolutely love that's the kind of film i like to see him doing something it can still be genre it can still be a big genre movie but something not as not not a massive big temple blockbuster summer film i think he was a little bit out of his depth of fantastic four obviously didn't really get along with fox it was a big you know, so I like to see him go back to a smaller movie, and that's exactly what he's going to be doing here. It looks like directing a gangster film, which would be pretty cool to see. We've never seen him do anything like that, and the fact that Tom Hardy's on board that's really exciting because obviously Tom Hardy did Legend last year, which was a, another gangster film about the Cray twins, and he was great in that. He's great in those kind of roles, and to see him in another gangster movie, Fonzo playing Al Capone, the infamous gangster, directed by Josh Trank. I think this has potential to be something really quite promising. I hope this turns out well for Josh Trent because obviously he needs a big comeback after Fantastic Four. And I think I think this has got potential to be something good. Obviously, Tom Hardy's in there as well, so I really hope this will turn out good. Next up, we have live-action Snow White movie is in development at Disney. And I'm not actually against this because I've been... I, I didn't think this would happen, to be honest with you, because we've got these other Snow White films. Obviously, we haven't had a live-action Disney one. We've had the like, Mirror Mirror. We've had the Snow White and the Huntsman. <sighs> like, oh, my God. Those, I, I thought because of those films, because it's still going now, the Huntsman Winter's War. But let's hope it's over now. And I really hope that now they'll just scrap that and just focus on this Disney one. Because, you know, I'm a massive fan of Disney and of the Disney live-action films. Not all of them, but, you know, apparently Cinderella was really great. I didn't get the chance to see that. But The Jungle Book, I absolutely love. The Jungle Book was my favourite Disney animated film. And I absolutely love what John Favreau did with that live-action movie. And, obviously, they can be doing Beauty and the Beast now as well. And the fact they're doing Snow White. A lot of people might be like, oh, another Snow White? But this is Disney. This is going to be like, you know, the Snow White version of Disney's Jungle Book, essentially, kind of. And, you know, I think Disney rarely make a mistake and do something bad in terms of these newer live action Disney movies anyway like I love the Jungle Book and I'm so looking forward to seeing this Snow White movie if I look a closer look at the article here it says that Erin Cressida Wilson who wrote the screenplay for Girl on the Train eh, is in talks to write a Snow White script while Ben Pasek and Justin Paul are aboard to write new songs okay and the film will expand upon the story and music from the 1937 original which saw Disney's very first animated feature film oh yeah and obviously we're going to be getting a live action version of Mulan as well I'm looking forward to seeing that but I'm a big fan of Snow White it's one of my favourite Disney animated films it's one of my favourite films in general probably I mean it's it's Disney's very first feature film and it's it's great you know it's not just because it's the first one it's overblown it is really good and i love the snow white animated film and to see a live action version of the animated film just brought to life in live action much more akin to the classic animated movie a musical the dwarves snow white and i actually really like the idea of daisy ridley being snow white probably won't happen um it'd probably be a better idea if they go someone with who's more of like not doing some of a big franchise but as soon as Daisy Ridley lost out on the Tomb Raider role to Alicia Vikander I thought oh let's have her as a young Snow White let's let's see that not thinking they would ever do that but now that they're going to be doing a Snow White I'd love to see Daisy Ridley in that role because obviously Snow White's uh, a lot younger than the other Disney princesses I believe and yeah I'm, I'm actually really excited to see this so really looking forward to Snow White live action Disney film probably more so than Beauty and the Beast 
although I am really intrigued to see a Mulan and Aladdin as well, so, you know. They're making a lot of these Disney live-action films, but I'm a massive Disney fan, and I love so many of these live-action transfers. The Jungle Book was just amazing. I absolutely love that. So just bring it on. The more the merrier, I see. <laughs> and lastly, in terms of movie news, I had that James Cameron wants glasses-less 3D. These comments from James Cameron really um, excite me, because if it was anyone else, they'd be like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, we're not getting that. But James Cameron has consistently shown us throughout his career that he's, he constantly pushes the boundaries as far as technology is concerned. We look back at Terminator 2 Judgment Day, what he's able to do there with the effects, what he did with Avatar. He even waited a decade to do Avatar because he wanted the effects to get up to par with what he wanted to do. And we saw how well that turned out. And he's even waited the best part of 10 years to get these sequels done because he really wants them to be as great, if not better than the first. And... Um, I think if anyone's capable of doing non-glasses 3D and really revolutionising 3D technology, it's James Cameron because he's shown us consistently, as I said, throughout his career, that he constantly pushes the boundaries of technology and doing new things, CGI, motion capture, 3D, we've seen it in Terminator, Avatar, so if anyone can do it, I think James Cameron can do it. It'd be really cool if we get to see the Avatar movies in 3D without glasses, because I'm not the biggest fan of 3D. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. But to have 3D without glasses, that would be such a big plus point, because I don't hate wearing glasses, but it's a little annoying how it's kind of obscured a bit. You know, it looks darker, not as clear and uh, crisp, but to have 3D without glasses, that'd be really cool. I don't know if that's possible, but... I have faith that James Cameron could be the guy to, to revolutionise that. So, yeah, that gets me excited. And there we go, that wraps up movie news. And let's just get into this with movie trailers now. First up, we have the first trailer release for Life, starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Ryan Reynolds. And I was actually, you know, most of the time I'm not that looking forward to seeing trailers, but I heard some really good things about this. It was meant to be kind of a sci-fi horror thriller in the vein of, like, Alien, kind of The Martian, Gravity, Prometheus, and... The trailer kind of underwhelmed me. I didn't have massive expectations going in, and I don't think it looks bad, but I I was hoping, I was expecting to be blown away by this trailer. I mean, like, oh my God, this looks really cool. But it just kind of looked, I don't know, it's kind of what they were going for. They were kind of going for a more kind of low-key, kind of more grounded, realistic tape. But it just came off a little dull, kind of. Again, this is the first trailer. It is just a trailer. The film could be absolutely amazing and awesome. I don't know. But this first trailer for life, it didn't really do it for me. It looks all right. A you know, great cast. I think it will turn out good, but it just didn't blow me away as far as the trailer is concerned. And next up, we have the first trailer for Gifted, directed by Mark Webb. A very different kind of film. This is more of Chris Evans, actually, more of an independent drama about him raising this young girl who's like this child genius and I really like this trailer actually I wasn't expecting to, to like it all that much but I'm a big fan of Chris Evans and I always love it when he goes away from it's a great thing about these actors in the Marvel movies they can do these big summer temple blockbuster movies like Captain America Avengers but then they can go away in between and do these smaller independent films and Chris Evans has been doing that he's been doing you know like you know, Avengers, then Snowpiercer, then more Captain America, and now he's going to this. I love how he's kind of balancing it between doing... Obviously, he did his own independent film as well. And this trailer, I actually really like the look of this trailer. I thought it would look a little cliche and a little just uninteresting, but I really like it. Um, and it's Mark Webb as well in 500 Days of Summer. I think it looks like this could be really good. Again, I love Chris Evans. The young girl looks really great as well, because sometimes child actors aren't that great, but she seemed really convincing, and a real great actress from what we saw in the trailer. Again, I like the concept, kind of like a Good Will Hunting kind of thing. It had echoes of other films as well, that I can't quite think of what it is, can't quite put my finger on it, but I really like this trailer, and it looks like it could be pretty good. And next up, finally, we've got the second trailer for a release for Wonder Woman. Again, this is a good trailer, and I did like this trailer. However, that being said, it was a little underwhelming for me, but I think the only reason it was, because the second time I watched it, I liked it more, it was just, I was so blown away by that first Comic-Con trailer that this was a little underwhelming for me. This was a little bit more of a by-the-numbers, generic kind of trailer. It's it's pretty good. It's a good trailer, cut together well, but it's a little bit more generic. Where I love that Comic Con trailer. That Comic Con trailer really blew me away. So I think it's just I had a little bit too high expectations going to this trailer. That being said, I still thought it was a great trailer. And for me, even though I'm slightly concerned about Gal Gadot's 
acting ability in terms of she hasn't really had that much experience in acting really at all. I just really buy her in that role. She really looks the part. She just looks great. And then whenever we see her in action in these trailers, I just fanboy out. I'm like, oh my God, it looks so great when we're seeing her in action. She really sells it in the physical department. She really looks the part. And when we see these shots of her in action, it just looks so unbelievably cool and awesome. I really can't wait. I think this is going to be the first DC movie. Even though I like the action in Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, I think the action in this is going to be the best yet. And I hope this will be the first DC movie to get everyone on board. I kind of think it will be good. I kind of think it will be well loved. I at least I hope so. At least more than Man of Steel and Batman v Superman and Suicide Squad were a lot more controversial and divisive films. Hopefully, this will be the first one to get a lot more people on board. I'm liking what we're seeing from these trailers. I'm loving Gal Gadot in the role of Wonder Woman in action in these trailers. I think Patty Jenkins has got a good hold and vision of what she wants to do with this film. And I'm really excited. Out of all the DC films, this is one I'm most excited to see because it looks so cool. And that we're finally getting a Wonder Woman film. And just, yeah, I cannot wait to see it. And lastly, we've got opening this week. First up is Nocturnal Animals that comes out November 4th. And also Arrival that comes out November 10th. Technically, it comes out November 11th, but I think with Arrival, we get it a day early in the UK, so I'm not complaining there. But yeah, Nocturnal Animals and Arrival are two films I'm really looking forward to seeing. I've heard great things about both. And yeah, I'm really intrigued by Nocturnal Animals. I really feel like that would be uh, my kind of film. It's this kind of crazy psychological thriller kind of film. It's like f- almost three different stories, three different films mashed together into one. It seems really cool from the trailers anyway. And also, I'm so unbelievably excited to see Arrival. I'm a massive fan of sci-fi. And I've been excited to see this for so long. And as soon as I saw the first trailer, I was like, oh my god. It looks so good. It has kind of echoes of like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 2001 Space Odyssey. And I cannot wait to see Arrival. So I'm going to be seeing both Nocturnal Animals and Arrival this coming week. And if you're tuning in to the beginning of next week's episode, you'll be able to hear my thoughts on both those two films. And that is where I'm going to wrap up this week's episode of the Friday Film Show. I've gone a little bit over here, but there was just a lot of stuff I wanted to talk about today. I spent probably a little bit too long on the movie news. But yeah, that wraps up this week's instalment of the Friday Film Show. What are your guys' thoughts on any of the movie news stories or trailers or new releases that I discussed in this week's episode? What do you think about any of them? Let me know your thoughts and opinions down below. And as always... If you like this, make sure to click subscribe to see more. But for now, I've been David O'Sullivan. I'll see you next time.